Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's July 4th, 2016. I'm David Knight. Here are our top stories. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. It seems all too often I have to begin this broadcast talking about the most recent terror attack, and today is no exception, this time at a restaurant in Bangladesh. It says up to nine gunmen entered, opened fire, and hurled makeshift bombs. Gunmen armed with pistols, swords, and bombs, according to a witness. A worker who escaped reported gunmen shouted, Alu Akbar, as they opened fire. Now, I'm not one of those hate all Muslims, kill all Muslims, blame all Muslims people, but... I do recognize the fact that this attack and the attack before that 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 all have the common theme of people said that they were doing it as the religion of peace. Once again, many nice Muslim people out there. But if I saw a crime wave or a you know series of crimes all perpetrated by Hindus or Christians for that matter, I would recognize the fact that they were doing that and I wouldn't redacted from the official FBI transcripts of what actually happened. So I think it is relevant. Now, is it to say that all of them are doing it? Absolutely not. But it is relevant as this is a motivating factor and it's something that definitely needs to be looked at. And um, it says nine gunmen so far. By the time you read this, it very well could have changed. Uh, more information may come available. They may have a more accurate body count, things of that nature. But uh, that's what it is for the time being. Now let's talk about some other news, bring it back here to the United States of America. And what difference does it make? Well, it makes a lot of difference for the fact that the Attorney General of the United States was meeting with Bill Clinton. And under normal circumstances, maybe this wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it just happens that uh, Bill's wife is under investigation by the feds and nobody on the left really seems to think that this is a pertinent amount of information. And we have the report right here. The FBI ordered a press blackout. The former president steps into her plane, and then they speak for 30 minutes privately, an ABC 15 reporter said about the Phoenix meeting. The FBI there on the tarmac instructing everybody around, no photos, no pictures, no cell phones. The FBI may have even violated 18 U.S. Code 242, which deprives rights under color of law, and it points to a conspiracy to, to subvert investigations targeting the Clintons because it's not the FBI's job to block journalists or even private citizens from filming public officials who are meeting in an official capacity. Now, according to Mrs. Lynch, they weren't talking about anything official. And I'd, matter of fact, let's just go ahead and listen to what she said the meeting was actually about. Was it appropriate for you to meet with former President Clinton um, while your agency is in the middle of an investigation of his wife's email servers? Well, I did see the president uh, at the Phoenix airport the other night as I was landing. He was headed out. Uh, he did come over and say hello and speak to my husband and myself and um, talk about his grandchildren and his travels and, and things like that. So that was the extent of that. And no discussions were held in any cases or anything of that. And he didn't raise anything uh, about that either. So according to Mrs. Lentz, they were just talking about golf and grandkids and puppy dogs and, and hot air balloons and all that. But now we see Judicial Watch is demanding that the Inspector General probe into the scandalous Lynch-Clinton meeting. And even Barack Obama's former advisor, David, David Axelrod, admitted that the meeting created bad optics. And of course, Trump jumped on this and he said, it was really a sneak. It was something that they didn't want publicized, as I understand it. I think it's so terrible. I think it's so horrible. I think it's one of the big stories of the week, of this month, of this year. And when you consider how uh, Mrs. Clinton is definitely under investigation, I think that is a pretty big deal for uh, Mrs. Lynch to be meeting with Bill. If nothing else, I think it's a conflict of interest. Is it criminal? I guess time will tell. But for right now, I think it is definitely a conflict of interest. And she has come out on record, uh, Mrs. Lynch, saying that she would not do this again, and also if you're going to do it the first time, you might as well just uh, let the reporters in so they can see that you talk about golf and uh, grandkids and all that kind of stuff. But this wouldn't be the first time the Clintons were up to something that, in my opinion, just wasn't no good. Uh, if you guys recall, it was earlier this year, and I guess going to last year as well, 
where Bill was out there campaigning at polling places. Now, for people who don't know this, like if you think about if you go to a grocery store or something where uh, the polls are open, you notice the guys in the back of the parking lot with their signs for their candidates or their flags or whatever is saying, hey, vote for, you know, candidate X. And the reason they're in the back of the parking lot, because they know you can't be in 150 feet of the polling place uh, influencing public opinion. Not only was Bill Clinton within uh, 150 feet, he was actually in the freaking polling place. <laughs> but nobody wants to take that too serious. And it says uh, former President Clinton, he appeared at the rallies for support of his wife. And the Secretary of State William F. Galvin told the New York Times that he had to remind the election workers that even a president can't go inside and work a polling place. That is correct, uh, Mr. Bill Clinton. You cannot be in there influencing the crowd, swaying it one way for your wife, you know, taking pictures as some of the reports say that he was doing it. Oh, just I'm, I'm, I'm out here talking. You know, I can't do the Bill Clinton voice, but you know how he sounds like. He's out there influencing public opinion for his wife. Can't do that. If you want to do that, you have to go stand in the back of the parking lot with everybody else. And once again, as we talk about the Clintons and the Clinton machine and all the things that they have going on, you guys know so much about Benghazi. We talked about it here extensively, but I want to talk about the Benghazi victims, uh, the wives, the children, the people who have to suffer the fact that their husbands, their fathers, you know, their, their brothers are not coming home. And we've seen multiple reports of people being uh, assured by Mrs. Clinton you know, by their telling of the story that, you know, she'd work the thing out, she'd get to the bottom of it. And later she came out and just said they're liars, they're blowing things out of proportion. And we have one of these people right here, Benghazi widow. Clinton has no right to tell me to move on. I think that nobody in government can tell me um, how I feel, what I should feel about it. She has no right, nor does anyone in government have the right to tell me it's time to move on. They're not in my shoes. You know, I think that, you know, that's the essence of what they have done is they've been dismissive. Now, in other news, as we were talking about earlier, then I guess the overall attitudes towards journalists, and we'll get into that a little bit more with the FBI from another angle. But right now, I want to talk about a former CIA operative, and she was giving tips to journalists on how to uncover information and also how to view information in the first place. In Iraq or Syria, and ask anybody why America dropped bombs. You get they were waging war on Islam. And you walk in America and you ask, why were we attacked on 9-11? And you get, they hate us because we're free. So those are stories manufactured by a really small number of people on both sides who amass a great deal of power and wealth by convincing the rest of us to keep killing each other. It's always interesting to me, the uh, flow of information. And I remember when I went to college, they made us watch this video or two movies, as a matter of fact. And at the time, I didn't really understand why we were watching these. I kind of felt like the uh, instructors were wasting our time, just giving us a day we didn't have to do any work. But now I understand them so much better. They were uh, Wag the Dog and also Network. You guys have probably seen Network. It's in our promo pieces for the Alex Jones Show. Uh, but basically, those two films, and there are many other books, uh, you know, uh, propaganda, other things out there that you can read that talk about the control of information and how you're being manipulated into something. For example, in Wag the Dog, they're trying to sell people this phony war. So they brought in this big time Hollywood producer to pretty much manufacture a war of sorts to uh, get people to buy into it. And that's what you see a lot on, uh, on your news channels. It's not so much a war, but they want you to buy into a certain way of thinking. I love the, uh, the old Saturday, Saturday Night Live sketch where they do the schoolhouse rock, but it's basically talking about how, uh, I believe it was NBC, yeah, it's Saturday Night Live on NBC, is uh, funded by a bunch of uh, defense contractors. They, they don't want you to know that they're def funded by a bunch of defense contractors. Meanwhile, they're propping up the war, just basic things like that. So it's a new way for you to view information. It just helps you, kind of like uh, in the movie They Live, put on the glass and then just see the propaganda for what it is. Now, as we're talking about censorship of journalists and how the FBI reacts to that, now we see secret rules make it pretty easy for the FBI to spy on journalists. The classified rules obtained by The Intercept and dating back to 2013 govern the FBI's use of national security letters, which allow the Bureau to obtain information about journalists' calls without going to a judge or informing the news organization being targeted. They have previously been released only in heavily redacted form. Media advocates said the documents show that the FBI imposes few constraints on itself, 
when it bypasses the requirements to go to court and obtain subpoenas or search warrants. That's exactly right. When you have a target, you're supposed to have a you know, probable cause. I'm looking at this person on this date and this activity for this reason. You can't just say, I feel like looking up Bob over here, so I'm gonna go uh, tap his phone or whatever it is that they do. That is illegal. And I know they have this holier than thou thing. I don't need permission of a judge to look at your documents because I'm fighting national security. Well, if you stop looking at all the journalist files and actually go look at the suspected terrorist, you may pretend, uh, prevent some terrorist activity, but that makes too much sense. You guys are gathering all this metadata, not just FBI, but uh, NSA, whoever else. They have all this mundane metadata on uh, normal people who are looking up Googling pressure cookers or uh, buying backpacks. And they got all this stuff. Meanwhile, the terrorists are running wild out here, not just in this country, but all around the world, because you guys have this congested apparatus. We can't even get to the information that you really need to keep the people safe. And this is a case in point of that. A suspected terrorist, the Istanbul terrorist mastermind, was a refugee protected by the EU. The Chechen national was on a Russian terrorism watch list since 2003 received asylum in Austria after he claimed he was severely tortured and under persecution by Russian authorities. He was later arrested in Sweden after Kalashnikov assault rifles, explosives, ammunition were found in his car, but he only spent over a year in jail. Russia again tried to extradite him later as he was crossing the border between Turkey and Bulgaria, but human rights groups pointed to his refugee status in Austria to block Moscow from getting their man. Yeah, if you guys also remember, who else was from Chechnya? Uh, the Boston Bombers, or at least the older brother, going to uh, various terrorist training camps, and uh, DHS calls us, or the Russian calls uh, DHS, and they're saying, hey, you might want to watch out for this, this our name. Like, yeah, 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 we got it, and we all know what happened later. Regardless of what you think about that whole official narrative, the point is that Russia was warning us, and Russia, the country we don't have the best of relations with, saw somebody who, who was such a serious threat in their mind that they picked up the phone and called us to warn us about it, but nobody really did anything. A similar thing with this guy, uh, because they were more concerned with being politically correct, uh, they said this guy is a refugee, he needs to be protected from those evil Russians, even though this guy uh, clearly was a danger, even before uh, the most recent terror attack. And this is the reason why I'm a fan of border security, I'm not gonna say a wall, uh, I think the wall will be largely ineffective, but it may have its uses in some places. But regardless, when I meet these people, they say, well, you should just have free open borders. Anybody can come in and out. I think once you're in the United States, you should be able to travel unmolested, no checkpoints, nothing like that. But to have a border at Mexico, have a border at Canada, international waters, yeah, I think those are there for a reason. And now it's getting to the point where even Uber drivers are getting suckered into this. And we see smugglers use Uber registered drivers to move migrants to U.S. border. And this is back on June 10th. Five vehicles carrying 34 Central American migrants were apprehended while traveling together. And to be perfectly clear, when we went out to the border earlier this week and we met the family out there, it's about 20 or so people, you know, traveling together, uh, mostly women and children. I have no issue with those people. My beef is not with them. They came from El Salvador. They were you know, walking for two months. Uh, they've ran out of provisions, water, food, whatever. They just have the clothes on their backs when they got here. I have no issue with people coming to the country. I do believe that you should do so legally, but if they find a legal reason or a legal avenue to do that, fine. Welcome to America. My issue is the guys like we just talked about right here. You have these free open systems where these guys can just walk in. The Border Patrol says they get maybe 40% of the people who come across the border. How many guys like this could there be in the United States of America right now? That's why you have a border system. That's why you have customs. That's why you have the border patrol checkpoints at Mexico. Now, in the country, I don't want to go to the checkpoint that's 100 miles inland where they ask me if I'm an American citizen and, you know, looking in the back at, at a Don because he's a brown-skinned gentleman. Uh, that's not my bag. But, you know, at the border, that's what I like, not the stuff that's going on here currently. And one of the things going on at the border is, of course, we're sending guns out. But now, what about guns in the country? Uh, now we see an anti-gun senator was arrested in Ferguson for carrying a 9mm. Long story short, uh, she was supposedly, allegedly, reportedly intoxicated. The cops wanted her to do a breathalyzer. She refused. And she was officially charged with failure to obey a lawful order of police and walking in the roadway. It's a very... Uh, 
interesting thing because we always see these anti-gun uh, senators, congressmen, like that guy out there in California who got arrested for butt running all those guns. And other guys around the country, they get arrested with guns, but they don't want you to have one because they think you're just as crazy as they are. Moving quickly now, talking about guns, ISIS is gunning down Christians in Egypt, but nobody cares because that's politically correct for them to do so. If uh, a Christian man shot somebody else of another religion, it would be an international sensation, but uh, they killed the gentleman, also a, uh, a Hindu priest, was killed back on June 7th, and you didn't hear anything about that because uh, it's not politically correct to talk about that. And briefly, before we go to break, come back with more special reports. Milo, you guys recall him, Joe Biggs, and he traveled around the country going to various rallies. Milo is going to hold a gay pride parade in uh, Sweden, uh, Swedish Muslim ghetto, because I don't know if you guys saw the report that Biggs, Leanne, and our new uh, hire, Margaret, did, talking about the uh, rape-free bracelets. And when you go to these countries, you just hold up your thing. They won't rape you or attack you. It's a complete joke. So he's going to go there to point that out, as well as other things. Stay tuned after this for more special reports. There are plans here in Texas for a high-speed rail project between Dallas and Houston. Now, that would not be national news, but what is national news is the process of eminent domain. This is something that is going to happen in your community. This is a glimpse of how large corporations and the federal government are coming into a state and running roughshod over the rights of individuals. Joining us now is Judge Ben Lamont. He is a Grimes County Texas judge. We're talking to Judge Lamont because he is one of a number of people, uh, county judges that we've talked to and others who are concerned about the Texas Central Rail Project. This is a high-speed rail project that's going to be running between Houston and Dallas. And it's an issue of national concern because this shows us what is going on with eminent domain, this process that is being shut down by major corporations. Uh, how they're railroading people in small areas like this. And understand, this isn't just about the rights of the few. They're going to be coming after your rights as well this way if we don't get the process right. If the people who are involved here are not compensated fairly, if they don't have full due process, they will do this to you wherever you live in this country. This is a foreign corporation that's coming in here, a Japanese corporation that's coming in here, allied with big business, big government, railroading this literally through the central uh, parts of Texas, through these small towns, and these people want to have a say. So joining us now is Judge Ben Lamont. Thank you so much for joining us, Judge. No problem. Glad to be here. Tell us a little bit about the history of this. How did this all come about? How did you first learn about this? How was it received by the community when they learned about this? I first learned about it uh, approximately... Uh, I guess December of 2014, somewhere towards the end of 2014, and it was, of course, not received well by by many people. Uh, we learned that, as it was promoted at the time, was was that it would go along or go in existing rights of way. That's how it was initially promoted. Along with existing things like uh, existing railroad beds or highways that were already there, that they would not need to cut through new paths through private property. That's correct. The, the, for the most part, the, the mm -hmm. bulk of the project, there might have been a, a, a small part of the project that did not go in an existing easement, but the vast majority of it was promoted and marketed as if it was going to go in existing rights of way, like a transmission line mm -hmm. or uh, right in the existing right of way of a, an existing railroad. And then you found out that they're not going to do that. As a matter of fact, they've got two routes. They haven't even decided which routes are going to go down, and yet they want to condemn property and confiscate property in both of these routes, even though they don't know which route is going down. Tell us a little bit about how they are skirting the typical process for eminent domain and what that process would be. Sure, sure. And, and this is a very complicated project in itself. It's, it's unlike any other uh, high, or rail project. Obviously, this is a high-speed rail project, but what they are attempting to do is they're trying to get the jurisdiction to be the federal government. That's the first issue. This clearly is a state project. should be regula regulated by the state of Texas, not the federal government. This is an intrastate project. It goes from point to point. Dallas to Houston does not connect in, into any other transportation mode that then in turn goes uh, across state lines. So that's the first issue. They're trying to get uh, jurisdiction to be the federal government via the Surface Transportation Board. The, so there's the, federal the, overreach involved here. And of course, one of the reasons for that, I believe, is because the corporation is going to run this is going to be a Japanese corporation. 
Well, they are the front company, I guess is what you would call the the face company of this uh, project, I believe is incorporated in Delaware. All the, the bulk of the financial, uh, uh, I mean, maybe 99% of the financing of this has been uh, committed from Japanese Bank of Inter International Cooperation. So definitely Japanese-backed project. It's a da Japanese train, Japanese business, it's Japanese government. That's that's the Japan Bank of International Cooperation. That's a state government over the, a state uh, entity, and they are committing to financing the whole project. So it, the front organization, the face front, is uh, is this. They claim to be a Texas organization, but it's really a front for uh, Japanese interests. So you've got the federal government exerting authority here in an area that is clearly self-contained inside the state of Texas. They should not have any involvement. What is the federal government doing to shut down uh, normal regulations and to shut down the normal process? So far, the federal government hasn't taken any action. So what's happened is this Texas Central Railway has filed two petitions with the Surface Transportation Board. The first petition, and these are these are the the mechanisms they are using to try to circumvent the normal procedures that are they being Texas Central Railway trying to uh, circumvent the normal procedures that ensure the due process and, and adequate compensation, fair compensation for, for the uh, instances you were describing before. So these two petitions they're filing are, the first one is a petition for clarification, and the second one is a petition for exemption of particular reg of certain regulations. So I'll take them one at a time. The petition for clarification is simply asking for what they call a clarification, but it's really rewriting law. It's it's a clarification to to make apparent that condemnation is not part of the quote unquote defined construction process. Okay, so historically speaking, construction the definition of construction in the context of of, of the Surface Transportation Board is backed up by case law. It is uh, includes condemnation, and so they are asking for a clarification to exclude condemnation or the the first half of condemn condemnation from the definition of construction. So, so essentially, critical. what we've got here in Texas is a two step process, right? We got Texas two step. They want to get rid of that first step completely and streamline this process, right? Well, they want to get rid of multiple steps. So that's mm -hmm. the first part. And the exemption from regulations would then allow them to do things out of sequence. For instance, it would allow them, they're very clearly asking for the ability to initiate the condemnation process before they have a, a, a defined route. As you said earlier, they don't have a defined route yet. Before the environmental impact study is complete, before the project has ever even been approved by the, the federal government or state government, before they have their financial package reviewed to make sure that they have that the money is there to actually not end up halfway down the road and, and not enough money to complete the project. There, there's a whole s series of regulations that, are, that normally occur in a sequence for a project of this nature, especially a startup company that's never operated and still does not operate a high-speed rail to this day. Wow. So uh, they are asking uh, clearly, and in their petition, they clearly acknowledge on a sworn, verified statement from the CEO, Tim Keith, that they understand this could result, that they would condemn properties or could uh, condemn properties that they would not even need for well, this Let me round. ask you about that, because we all got a couple of minutes left. If they take your property, and because we can talk about what happens uh, when they come through and perhaps, I guess, just compensate people for the swath of land that they take, but they might cut somebody's property in half. Uh, they also affect the real estate values throughout the community when they run that high-speed uh, train rail through there, uh, lowering their values. And those people, I, I guess, would not be compensated. But what about the people that they take their land and they don't even use it for the railroad? What happens then? Does the railroad be able, uh, will they be able to later then sell that as a higher price after the uh, value goes up and people find that it's not going to have a railroad running through it? Uh, it's, it's a good point. The, the, the real damage is caused by the disruption of, the, of somebody's life. You know, by then everybody's had to move away. They're gone. They moved and, and changed their whole life to, to go around this railroad project that didn't even happen. I don't know how you undo that damage. I don't think you can. And there's not a price tag associated with it. You know, the, the other 
broken part of the condemnation process for this particular project is we've never had a high-speed rail. So the condemnation process, as it stands today in Texas, for a project of this nature, you could have a situation, let's say if somebody had 500 acres and their house was, you know, let's say 6,000 feet away from the rail line, you could have somebody that's across the street, maybe 300 feet away from it. But although, and since the rail would, does not go over their property, even though their home is closer to that rail wow. than the than the property that's on, they would not get a dime. Right, your, your your governor, lieutenant governor, your state elected officials. That's where the real battle we hope is going to end up at the end of the day. Please let them know that the process is broken for this, and and that we're well, against the the project. It's going to end up in taxpayer subsidy. Yeah. We're going to pay for it multiple times, and it's an abuse of eminent domain. Thank you so much, Judge. Uh, good luck in your fight. And again, you're chairman of the uh, Texans Against High Speed Rail, uh, Judge Ben Lamont. Thank you so much. Good luck yes, to you. Thank you. The air clear about this. The email scandal, I believe, was brought out by the Clintons. Now, I would be pleased to talk more about this important matter, but I know there have been questions about my email, so I want to address that directly, and then I will take a few questions from you. You see, we knew running for election. You never want to run as the anointed one. You always want to run as the underdog. Now, it's kind of hard when you're building Hillary Clinton with all the hoopla and who they are now. How do you get to be the underdog? If you look at the email scandal, where did the email scandal come from? The New York Times. The New York Times has never been anything but a PR firm for the Clintons. Even if they had it, there is no way the New York Times would have broke a story about Hillary that could do damage to her. But look what she's done. They have used the email scandal to catapult them into an underdog status. Now, as we get closer to the election, when you get through the primary and you get into the general election, I can tell you, New York Times read my lips. Go ahead and write the article. It's probably already written. Right when they get into the general election, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, oh, we've checked all this out, and it turns out there was nothing to it. That's what's going to happen. It's all used to stage Hillary. Now, if you don't believe me, remember when Hillary ran against Barack Hussein Obama. She should have used our system then, but she didn't. She came in and she was the anointed one. And he whooped her. She's not making that mistake this time. And by the way, if you notice, Hillary's also done the other thing you have to do at the formative stage of a campaign. She's going around, she's sucked up all of the money that's out there. So anybody tries to run against her, I hear people ask me, what do you think about Biden? I don't think about anybody. What are they going to run against her with? They have already laid claim to the money. Once uh, the American public begins to see the emails, uh, they will have an unprecedented insight into uh, a high government official's uh, daily communications, which I think will be uh, quite uh, interesting. You may have seen that I recently launched a Snapchat account. Those messages disappear all by themselves. You see, when Hillary gets in office within six months, according to the plan we wrote back in 1986, literally there's a plan called the 86 plan, and it's where we finalized and put everything down. Within six months, she will make Bill ambassador to the U.N. When Bill gets to be ambassador to the U.N., it won't be six months then because of the Clinton Foundation, what they've used the Clinton Foundation for, it won't be six months until he's made Secretary General of the UN. Now, can you imagine the power Bill and Hillary have? I mean, they will have achieved more power than 
any couple in the history of the world when they pull that stunt. On January 20th, 1993, William Jefferson Clinton became the 42nd President of the United States. At the time, most Americans were not aware of the extent of Clinton's criminal background, nor were they aware of the media blackout, which kept this information from the public. As State Attorney General and later Governor, Bill Clinton in 12 years achieved absolute control over the political, legal, and financial systems of Arkansas. As president, he would attempt to do the same with the nation by bringing members of his inner circle with him to Washington. The hijacking of America was underway, and its impact on future generations would be incalculable. It was years, years ago when uh, I was picked up by a man named Mr. Witt Stevens, and Mr. Witt was the brother to Jack Stevens, Jackson Stevens, and they were the king makers in Arkansas. So they called me one day and said, we need to meet with you, and I met with them, and they said, we need you uh, to take a look-see at a guy that we think we can make governor, and we want him to be the youngest governor in the history of the country. So I agreed, and then uh, that's when I met Bill. When I met with him, it was kind of weird because I was talking to him, and he was chasing after the waitresses. And uh, I would try to get his focus, and all he would do is just chase after the waitress, just watch, man, I want some of that, man, I want some of that, and it just went on and on and on. And finally to the point where I had actually gotten a little bit perturbed about it and said, man, this, you know, we gotta figure this out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was attorney general at the time. And so, I went back the next day to Mr. Witt and told him what I thought. I said, Mr. Witt, this guy is, is a sexual predator. He's not just a womanizer. I mean, I'm telling you, this guy's sick. And uh, he's a pathological liar. I mean, and I told Mr. Witt, I couldn't even make him tell the truth. And when it came to something he could tell the truth on that would be harmless to him, he still couldn't tell him. Well, Mr. Witt said, you can break him, break him of that. We'll, we'll have a talk. So I figured, what the heck. A couple, three weeks passed. <clears throat> they met with Bill. Apparently, they got everything worked out the way they wanted it. And he was in the game running for governor. I'm Margaret Hell for Infowars.com. There's a new study coming out by the Center for Immigration Studies, which Jessica Vaughn, she's the policy director for that center, she asserts that nearly one million people are in the U.S. and they've been given orders to deport, to leave immediately. They're still staying. She lays out some reasons why. Let me get into these numbers for you. She says a small fraction of the immigrants that are being detained by ICE they're actually on an ordered removal list. She's citing 925,193 aliens are still here despite those deportation orders. And she lists some reasons why. She says that the U.S. officials, they feel constrained on how to release them. They feel pressure from the feds to go ahead and release them. Then you have sanctuary cities that thwart deportations and other issues that the, the host country simply won't take the citizen back, so they're forced to stay. Now, the troubling aspect of her report is that she details 170,000 people that are here illegally, that are actually convicts, they've been convicted of crimes, but they're still walking around and uh, little is being done to, uh, to deport, to enforce those deportation orders. I want to take you to one case in particular that's breaking in Oregon. One of these 170,000 convicted that have not yet been deported is Bonifacio Aseguero Gonzalez. And this man has been accused of shooting four people in Oregon 
killing three of the people that he actually shot. This happened on a blueberry farm outside of Woodburn, Oregon. And ICE put a written statement out of the accused, of Mr. Asaguero. This is what they had to say about uh, the situation that he's in. And you were not, you're not even going to believe this. He was deported five times. This is his sixth entry into the U.S. where he's killed three people and seriously injured a fourth. They say after conducting a comprehensive review of Mr. Azaguera's immigration and criminal history, U.S. Immigration and Customs to that end, the agency filed a notice of action with the Marion County Jail asking to be alerted if or when Mr. Azaguera is slated for release so the agency can take custody or pursue further administrative enforcement action. Relevant databases indicate Mr. Azaguera has no significant prior criminal convictions. However, he has been repatriated to Mexico six times since 2003, most recently in 2013. Let me see if I get this straight. He was deported six times, gained successful reentry, and then subsequently killed three people. That's what we're talking about here. This was the official statement that they were unsuccessfully able to repatriate him back to his host country for whatever reason. And uh, if that doesn't spell out a system that is indescribably broken, I don't know what does that specific case. Now, the final orders for removal, they're largely ignored by nearly one million out of a system that um, our federal government said is working just fine. And these numbers that Jessica Vaughn looked at for the Center for Immigration Studies, these numbers, they only indicate roughly 10 percent of the people that um, she indicates technically should have a deportation order. So we're just talking about 10 percent of that group. And um, a very defunct system that seems dysfunctional without any real enforcement aspect in place. I want to take you to a story now coming out of Memphis regarding the TSA. You know those agents that have been deputized to act basically like police officers? What they did to one young woman in their care is absolutely despicable to me. It makes me so sick. I'm trying hard not to use profanity on the air anymore because I told my mom I wouldn't. We're talking about a case. Uh, with a young lady. She's 19 years old. She's disabled. She's blind in one eye, partially paralyzed and deaf. And as she was traveling through the Memphis airport, I'm speaking of a young woman named Hannah Cohen. She was going to St. Jude Hospital in Chattanooga, the to and from trip Chattanooga, Memphis, to treat her brain tumor. She goes through the uh, TSA checkpoint, sets off the metal detector alarm, to which she freaks out understandably. Um, her mother said that she um, didn't know what was going on, gets, gets confused very easily, and then she tries to run. She resists uh, the TSA arrest of her, if you will, to which a TSA officer then grabs her, slams her head to the ground at the point where she's bleeding. I encourage you to go and look at these photographs online for a more in-depth report of Hannah's story. Uh, her skull, you can actually see blood dripping from her head. It was all over the floor. Uh, bashing her head um, that had a brain tumor in it uh, that she was getting treated for, bashing it on the floor. Hannah later gets arrested, uh, taken downtown to the Memphis jail and booked. Instead of spending the night celebrating um, what should have been her last treatment, she spends it behind bars. Now, the charges against Hannah were ultimately dropped in this case. Oh, that was really big of them. But the TSA, they released a statement regarding people like Hannah. Just in case you didn't get the heads up, here it is. The TSA says the passengers must give a heads up. Um, if they have special needs, well, okay, we'll just all be sure and remember to do that so that your head's not bashed into the ground the next time you're not sure what to do, you get disoriented or you freak out. Now, this story, it's reminiscent of uh, the TSA expansion of authority regarding checkpoints. We've covered here on InfoWars uh, the Ataturk airport bombing in Turkey and uh, what this means for you and I at home. Now, we know um, the governments have, they have this big push that they're going to start stepping up checkpoints, doing random searches. And uh, we've covered this extensively this past week. But this, these TSA checkpoints, of course, they're for your safety. Everything that they're doing is just for your safety and security. It's not to uh, in any way, um, you know, abuse their power or authority, take away your basic rights. Don't worry. It's, it's, all, it's all just for you. But here's what they're going to try to do. So they're going to set up these, these checkpoints in the parking lot, um, randomly screening people as they step into the airport, uh, stop and frisk, if you will. And it's all in the name of catching people before they enter the security checkpoint of TSA because we know that the bombers were actually on the other side of the glass in Turkey. So they're going to try to prohibit that from happening, stepping out into the parking lot. Now, this isn't the first time that they've actually tried to do this measure. In 2009, 
We found a clip of this in our InfoWars um, encyclopedia of videos, if you will. We found a clip of this 2009 Tennessee TSA, a brief clip for you, where the TSA was taking it to the streets, randomly stopping people and searching cars. Take a look. You're probably used to seeing these signature blue uniforms at the airport. But now TSA agents are on the interstates fighting terrorism with visible intermodal prevention and response or VIPER operations. Where is the terrorist most apt to be found? Not these days on an airplane, more likely on the interstate. Tuesday, Tennessee was the first to do this simultaneously at five way stations and two bus stations statewide. The TSA using their power for good, all in the name of just keeping us safe. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. Well, that's it for our show tonight. I definitely encourage you to have a fun and safe 4th of July. I'm Jakari Jackson from the Infowars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. That's veteran Denver police officer Charles Jones IV smashing an unarmed suspect in the face six times. Officers accused of using excessive force on a suspect and then trying to erase the evidence. I'm, I'm observing what they're doing and they're arresting me. I don't understand what's going on. A community rates low on an information scale when the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? How can you ask such a question? What difference at this point does it make? When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in the community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. There are actions I have the legal authority to take as president that will help make our immigration system more fair and more just. Tonight, I'm announcing those actions. What I say goes, see? I'm the law around here. <laughs> he came, he saw, he died. <laughs> yes, in modern warfare, our military leaders are finding that words and ideas are highly effective weapons. You just have to be repetitive about this. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. We are trained to deceive if we have to. You really don't have to trust me. You shouldn't trust me. In fact, by my actually participating in that, I will taint the news. In communities of this kind, despotism stands a good chance. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are... I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Okay, Miss Hughes, well, we're, we're going to do everything we can to help you. <laughs> Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. It's the Alex Jones Show, because there is a war on for your mind. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday.